Actually, invite um, Greg and Hans um, and Prashant back up um, for a moment. We have a few more moments before we end this session. Um, and um, we're, I, I want to ask a couple questions of the panelists to have a little bit of a discussion. We will after, we'll have a little break in about 10 minutes, and then um, we will after that have another session that will um, give us an opportunity to have a broader conversation about some of these issues with these panelists and across the room. Um, so, so don't despair. We'll have, a little more, we'll have lots more time to talk about some of these issues. Um, I want to take sort of a moderator prerogative, though, to ask a couple of questions. Um, and my first question um, is to is to Greg and to Hans, um, which is, um, if you uh, were giving advice um, to a another um, pharmaceutical company, to another firm um, who was um, thinking of uh, sort of following the path that you've laid, laid out, either in the um, in the partnership um, access program or in the um, intra-country price discrimination um, uh, approach. Uh, what would you say uh, to another company about um, about what works and what that wasn't, and, and, and when when you might uh, think that this is uh, a good a good idea um, to pursue the path that you've laid out? Hans, do you have a few quick thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to build on what you said, Craig, because uh, you know exactly that has been challenging for us. Um, trying to maximize access to coartum. Um, you know, wasn't always kind of seen favorably by the teams that are indeed incentivized on top line and bottom line results um, within those malaria endemic uh, markets. Um, and, and that has, you know, really been a struggle for us, especially when, when new donor funded programs, uh, you know, came into being, which, you know, were potentially uh, seen to be cannibalizing. Although, if you look at that pyramid that I gave, uh, and that's, I think, my, my point of advice. You know, when, when you go and think about such an access program um, and also building on what you said, uh, Prashant, you know, the segmentation, get that really well understood by every stakeholder within your organization. Uh, because when you do that well, um, I think you will be able to actually, you know, get the best out of two worlds well combined. That's great. And I'm going to ask, ask one, more, one more question, um, and this one is for you, Hans. Um, and I know this is in a different section of your uh, world, but when I was in government, I was involved in a program called the Patents for Humanity uh, program, and, and um, both, uh, both of the models that you've talked about here today have been recognized in that way. Um, but there also was recognition last year of something that, um, that Novartis did that I thought um, might be an interesting example for us to discuss in the research collaboration space, um, which related to um, a compound um, that you were working on um, and developed out of, I think, is NITD, which is the, um, the infectious uh, disease um, uh, shop within uh, Novartis, where um, you, you identified a compound um, that showed some promise um, in the, uh, in the tubercul tu tuberculosis space um, that you weren't planning to pursue um, and made an affirmative decision uh, to license it to uh, the, uh, the tuberculosis um, uh, research cons consortia um, that were trying to sort of take that research one step further. And I, I just thought um, I'd give you the chance to sort of identify the rationale um, behind doing that and also sort of think about whether that's a model um, in, where, where there isn't necessarily a commercial plan to take some research forward um, to think about ways of putting that into um, the sort of public domain or at least into the domain of researchers who are uh, working on R&D into, um, into drug categories uh, that primarily affect the poor. Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. So, so the, the TB work that Quinton referred to um, came out of uh, our Novartis Institute of Tropical Diseases in uh, Singapore. Uh, which had been created about a decade ago, um, indeed to work on compounds uh, to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis and dengue. And then malaria was actually added to that mandate later on. Um, I think the reason for the company to decide to basically, you know, transfer that knowledge the, and that those assets to the Global TB Alliance was um, that we felt that we didn't have in-house the optimum of, you know, skills, resources to take these compounds further through development. And, you know, based on our collaboration with the TB Alliance over the years, 
we believe that they would be able to get, let's say, more value out of this than by us, you know, continuing to do it in-house. Prashant or Colin, do you have anything to add on to the sort of um, sort of menu of options that we want to leave on the table for our discussion session that's coming up after the break? Yes, I think on, on this issue of um, transferring R&D, which is otherwise not going to pass the commercial threshold, I think we have, we have several institutions which we call as product development partnerships, and I think it is now a matter of understanding whether the product development partnerships, whether it's GB Alliance or DNDI or MMV, are they the ones who should keep reaching out to industry partners and say, can we look for something, can we find a good collaboration, or can we see a model in which, uh, like the NITD example, actively a company goes and says, here's what we have, is this of use to you? And I think the patent pool, there are multiple mechanisms that are trying to achieve that. I think that's a very promising area. It needs some more operational uh, definitional in, in a better sense, but otherwise I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah, and, you know, not, not to call anyone out, but when the, you know, with, when the Ebola crisis sort of hit and sort of uh, started to, um, to move outside of West Africa, there was sort of a moment when a bunch of companies came together and said, now we're going to share our research. Um, and that was, I think, an important catalytic moment and a very uh, powerful act of public service. But it does beg the question, why weren't you doing that all along with respect uh, to the drug um, development or the relevant research relating to Ebola? Um, and what can we do to make sure that the kind of collaboration that happened post-outbreak <coughs> Um, in that context happens much earlier. And are there things that we can do as a research community or as, as, as academics that can kind of de-risk that process? So to the extent that companies are nervous about um, uh, you know, potentially commercially viable research getting you know, uh, revealed through the, those, those processes, can we figure out how to, how to de-risk that so that there's earlier and better collaboration? Colleen, I'll give you the last word. The last comment I would make is that it seems like across the board, each set of um, kind of practices has, there are a lot of things that are particular to each vertical. So whether you're talking about hep C and the need for a financing mechanism, or you're talking about the differences between, um, as uh, Prashant was describing, um, diseases which affect poor and rich countries versus those that are primarily poor, or you're talking about emerging threats like Ebola, each area has its own kind of particular, each vertical weather condition or has, each, has its particular kind of question. So if we are going to kind of try to brainstorm kind of next steps, it seems like it's important to figure out to which disease area and which set of problems are we talking about? Because there's just, there has been a lot of discussion here um, and I, you know, some of the lessons will be applicable more in, in one, some areas than others. That is a terrific segue to our next session. Um, just a, f a couple pieces of housekeeping. Um, we are going, to, there's some um, coffee and things over there. We're going to take a 15 minute break now, so we'll start a little bit after 11 o'clock. We're also going to turn off the live stream and the video until the afternoon um, session. Um, and right after the break, Mark Wu um, from the Harvard Law School is going to continue this conversation um, and try to break it down um, in terms of uh, market types um, and uh, particular concrete uh, circumstances under which uh, we might um, replicate and scale up uh, some of the examples that we talked about in the first panel. Um, but let's give a round of applause for our, for our panels. Um, and let's take a 12-minute a, a break. Thank you.